Uh, we'll start with uh, introductions. I'm uh, Pat Malone, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Annabelle Hadamio, Commissioner. Welcome to the Space Age. Joe Kirby, County Administrator. All right, uh, that, uh, those four of us are in the room and now we'll start uh, with uh, people that are uh, uh, calling in. Didn't hear her, and she did. Charlie Fountain Health Department. Daniel Brown, Health Department. George Lee, Public Works. John Starr, a member of the public. Dave Buzzi, EOC Board. Lilia Neville, Board of Commissioners. And I see uh, Mary Otley is with us this morning. Um, Ryan Vogt from uh, Council of Governments. Um, Sarah Hartstein and Nancy Weiss. And I think we have a, um, I assume, I assume Brian Lee is with us. I don't have any email, Commissioner, from Brian. So maybe Dave. Um, I am actually attending for Brian. Okay. Uh, okay. He's got stuff going on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I see Mike Wildstein, and I'm not sure if. Good morning. Uh, morning, Mike. Hello. And we, gotcha. ha we have. Uh, did. did um, Zan, introduce herself. Hi, Pete Okay. Well, uh, Commissioner Ogero is uh, calling in, and I think that's pretty much everybody. Uh, so we'll go to announcements. Are there any uh, announcements? Uh, all right, comments from the public. We have a couple um, citizens with us this morning. Any comments? Hearing none, we will uh, move on to item three, review and approve the ad agenda. Any uh, additions or corrections? I don't see anything, so I'll move uh, to uh, approve the agenda. And we have a second for that, Zan? Second. It's been moved in, uh, to uh, approve the agenda. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Item four, chair decisions. There, there have been none since we last met. Uh, so we're on to item five, uh, our work session uh, report from the EOC and it uh, looks like we'll start off with you, uh, 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 Dave Busby. So good morning, commissioners and uh, distinguished guests, and all the uh, great people out there. We are continuing to do important work for the community um, in the EOC and the main focus of objectives, we mentioned it previously at one of these meetings was we're working on a mass distribution plan. Uh, we're finalizing those details. Uh, things are going pretty well. We do have a lot of the unincorporated areas uh, that were mentioned before as a priority. Uh, so those are included in the plans and we have both site distribution. The economic recovery team is doing a distribution and the public health department through all of the channels that they have already established with groups that they're working with. So that is proceeding pretty well. Uh, very pleased with the progress on that. We are going to have a meeting later this afternoon with those key groups and kind of just check in to see where everybody's at. 
Uh, and and um, other than that, we plan to have a complete PIO, public information kind of push to make sure everybody in the community knows about what's going on, why it's going on, and uh, what we're trying to do with that. Other than that, our other focus is the Public Health Department Operations Center and finishing the plans to get that uh, established and um, people assigned to it. And pending any questions, commissioners um, or anybody else, I have nothing further to report. All right. I, I have a comment. Uh, Chief, how, what, what, what are you hearing from the community? Is there still a lot of anxiety out there? Uh, are you are you getting any feedback yeah it's actually been a little bit rewarding so i've reached out to a lot of faith-based organizations um the mayor of monroe and all of the kind of every time that we have these discussions the community is very interested in both getting masks and um, hand sanitizer and so there's a lot of interest out there um and so it's kind of a uh, rewarding project in that way to make sure that we're getting the things that the community needs out to them uh, as efficiently as we get that done. But there is definitely an interest. Thank you. Well, if uh, Alyssa was here, I would uh, ask her about the uh, communication piece. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, comments, Lilia? Uh, about uh, helping this uh, uh, effort in getting the word out? Uh, Alyssa, uh, we just had a... Lily was at our morning brief this morning, and she uh, will, there will be a PIO representative at our meeting this afternoon. So oh. we'll have... Uh, the entire thing is to get all of these details aligned and make sure that we get accurate information out to the community. Is this for mass distribution? Uh, yes. Yes, I will be attending the meeting and we'll be coordinating with the Joint Information Center to get word out. Okay. And any uh, comments on how that's going or what, what the... Um, so far we're on standby while decisions are finalized and then once we have the go ahead, um, we will be working on producing materials and we'll be using a few different avenues to get the word out through social media, through some printed materials, things like that. Great. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else uh, for Dave? Well, I have a question that's not for Dave, but just just kind of related, just wanting to check in on, on the two cases we have uh, in the county. Will we have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit or just want to know how that's going? Uh, Commissioner, we can certainly uh, talk about that uh, to the degree that we can. There are some privacy issues that we have to uh, adhere to surrounding that, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those uh, mm -hmm. to the degree that I can. Okay, the process at Avery uh, went well, the cleanup. Well, uh, let's finish with Dave. Oh, okay. And, and uh, uh, appreciate the efforts, Dave, and keep us posted. Uh, I mean, uh, however we can uh, help get the word out, uh, this is really a critical piece that uh, uh, I'm glad so far it sounds like it's going well. So, uh, yes, sir, I believe so. Thank May you. I jump in, please? Uh, I do have one clarification question, and that is when you refer to the public health information team, I'm assuming you're referring to the JIC and the fact that we have teams for the Joint Information Center for uh, for two teams, but not three full teams yet. So public health is a part of, uh, I'm not sure on that one if I'm answering it, but public health is a part of the JIC and yet. So all of the efforts are aligned um, and we're also trying to give some of our PAOs who have been working months on end to yeah. get word out to the community. We're trying to give them a little bit of a break. Um, so Lilia has come up with a pretty good schedule to coordinate all of that. But yeah, public health is definitely a, a component of that. When, when you referred to the JIC earlier, you called it the public health information team and it confused me. That's all I was asking. Um, so yeah. Sorry. All right. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, next up, uh, I 
Are you going to go uh, next, Charlie? Yeah, I can do that, Commissioner. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, so the, the first thing I was going to touch on is uh, uh, just the, the overall, we don't have today's numbers. It's still being processed. So um, as of yesterday, 117 confirmed cases, 19 presumptives. Uh, um, so relative to the rest of the state, Benton County is, is still doing quite well, although you know, we, we continue uh, this, this incremental uh, increase, which is worrisome in the demographics um, that, that we're seeing remain worrisome. Um, regarding specifically the workplace investigation in uh, Benton County facility that, uh, that Commissioner Jaramillo just asked about, um, that investigation uh, was triggered on Friday and uh, our team swung right and actually worked all weekend, which actually is, is fairly typical, but uh, this time it was the county's turn to, uh, to put the team to work over the weekend. Um, I, I must say I want to really give uh, a, a very large uh, message of thanks to uh, the department heads and managers uh, throughout the, the departments that operate out of the Avery complex. Um, the timeliness of, uh, of responses by Gary and Greg and Lori was outstanding. We got great information. The staff was, was very accessible and um, we were able to, to do our uh, investigation, our contact tracing work uh, very rapidly it is time consuming, it's difficult, uh, particularly during weekend, but um, everyone involved uh, really bent over backwards and did their best uh, to, to give uh, the involved staff a heads up so they knew to expect calls from public health and, and uh, all the staff were very responsive. Um, of course, in all these cases, uh, contact investigations go on. Uh, we, we put a lot of credence in corroboration, not just a, a single person's uh, story, and, and there's still some, uh, a few outstanding tests, and so we continue to watch that. But, uh, but overall, a really strong effort on the part of uh, county administration, management, and staff. So I want to thank everyone for that effort. It was very, very helpful. Um, any questions about that? Uh, I, I had one, uh, Charlie. What kind of turnaround time are we getting on uh, uh, test results? So we, we analyze that actually every week on Tuesday. Uh, so uh, last week's so overall results from all our laboratories, we were averaging uh, a little over five days turnaround, which was down from about 6.5 days the week before. Uh, we know a couple of those labs uh, made some staffing uh, and equipment adjustments. We're hoping for that number to keep going down. Um, so uh, I will have more information on, uh, on an individual lab and our, our average turnarounds later today. Well, it, I mean, it sounds, uh, that sounds like too long for... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, from public health point of view, anything over two days is, is problematic. Um, you know, that, that is really the ideal. Um, the difficulty here um, is volume and um, you know, we, we really are, are concerned about that. Um, if we can't keep up with this, then um, you know, increased testing and surveillance testing in the fall and testing asymptomatic people and doing community surveillance, uh, we have some concerns that that'll even further overburden the limited lab system. Um, you know, we want all that information. We want that surveillance information. 
but we do still have some concerns about laboratory capacity for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions for Charlie? I have a couple of other items. Okay. I just wanted to make sure if there are any any questions specifically about the uh, the county situation. Okay. Did that answer your question, Annabelle? Uh, yeah, I think it did. I just wanted to, uh, um, what I saw was what I read in the paper about it, so so just wanted to, to get it from, from our point of view. Yeah, so commissioners, nothing has changed since I briefed you over email this weekend. Uh, the facility was sanitized on Saturday uh, to CDC standards, uh, so the work that we committed to doing on Friday has been completed and uh, trying to keep you updated via email as we experience these bumps along the road. All right, uh, go ahead, Charlie. Okay, I've got a, a, a couple of items about uh, internal communicable disease program operations and then one, uh, one brief update about state plans. So um, we're making, as you know, we were recruiting for, we've been recruiting actually for several months for a new communicable disease nurse manager uh, to take my place there and to add depth to the nursing management system with my uh, my retirement out on the horizon or pretty the horizons getting nearer all the time um, and unfortunately our external uh, recruitment was unsuccessful we had a a surprising number of applicants, but um, unfortunately, um, none that, that we considered to have the right fit of skills um, and availability and, uh, and background uh, to, to fit the needs of the county. So what I've done is some internal adjustments. Um, Charlene Yeager, who you guys know as nurse manager, who's been overseeing uh, public health nursing programs, including home visiting and immunization and reproductive health, as of August 1st, will become the manager for communicable disease. So uh, hats off to Char. She's uh, taking this transfer voluntarily. Um, she's eager to, to get a hold of that team. She's been working with that team uh, all the time through COVID uh, on top of her other duties. And um, so I will be doing uh, some, some mentoring and turnover and training and introducing her to state folks. But as of August 1st, she will become the manager of record for communicable disease. Uh, the home visiting program, because uh, home visiting is on a, a bit of a hold with the universally offered home visiting, I'm actually putting one of the, uh, the nurses, uh, Carol Elizondo, who has uh, been holding down the fort and home visiting, will take Char's place in an acting and capacity work out of class position. Um, and we will transfer the recruitment and look for a home visiting nurse manager um, who may be a, a easier skill set for us to uh, recruit for uh, than communicable disease, especially uh, with what's going on currently. Um, so uh, Carol uh, has stepped up to that. Um, she's got uh, leadership experience in the past, knows the program, knows uh, the state players behind that. So again, thanks to both of them. And I think this really uh, solidifies particularly the, the communicable disease program and COVID response uh, through my transition. Um, Related to that, um, Joe has uh, approved uh, use of CARES Act emergency funding to hire some additional full-time staff uh, on a limited duration temporary basis for communicable disease. So we'll be hiring five full-time uh, people uh, for uh, in that and so um, we've got interest from outside uh, we're finalizing the the intake right now 
and I anticipate probably by next week some of those people will be on board and, and get them trained up. So that'll really increase uh, capacity and again provide a lot of relief to a team that's been working seven days a week for several months now um, and is really uh, reaching the, the limit of their capacity. Um, in addition to that, using COVID funding, uh, CHC is funded one new navigator, as you know, public health is funded one new navigator, plus two interns for equity work, and all of them will be cross-trained as contact investigators and be able to work on prevention and, and outbreak management. Uh, my one update from the state, uh, you guys know about the governor's news conference today at 1.30 in which you'll be talking about uh, school metrics. Um, there is an indication that there may be an announcement later this week about some other uh, precautions and uh, restrictions uh, potentially in the state. Um, you know, they do the state data run every Wednesday, um, all, all of those uh, metrics. And uh, last week when the, when the governor uh, did the, the rollback of restaurant and bar opening times, the other limitations, she indicated there may be other restrictions um, on their way depending on what those metrics do. And, and our understanding is that some of those are under serious consideration. So stand by for, uh, for possible additional announcements later in the week. What time is that, Charlie? The, today's news conference is at 1.30. One thirty. School metrics. Thank you. There's also a Q&A for commissioners um, and later in the afternoon. And uh, that email, I believe, came from Gina Nickel um, at AOC. So that's all I have. Uh, if there are no questions. Well, if there are questions, please go ahead. Otherwise, over to Danielle. Any, any questions for Charlie? Uh, just a quick one. Uh, with uh, the shuffling of, of, of people, and congratulations to Shar um, Yeager for taking on the new role, uh, that uh, we have now more depth so that we, you can have a rotation of management of that team. Is that the, the biggest change that's occurring? Uh, because I understand that there have, we've had several contact tracers and a pretty deep bench there, but just not enough to keep that seven day a week going. I, I'm a little confused about some of the capacity issues there. Yeah, the capacity is, is uh, not as critical in management as in staff. So with these additional emergency hires, what, uh, what we anticipate uh, being able to do, what we plan to be able to do as soon as these people are up to speed is convert the entire team to four tens. Um, which will provide them with some, some real uh, actual time off and rest and, and off duty. Um, at this point, there's just not enough depth in the full time. You know, having a bunch of part time temporary contact tracers is nice, but people are available a few hours here, a few hours there, and even tracking that becomes quite burdensome. Um, it, it's difficult for those folks to maintain their skills. Um, sometimes they're available when there's not new cases and they're not needed and then not necessarily available when they are needed. So these full-time staff will be a huge assistance, will be reliably, be dependable, and we can do a, an actual staffing rotation that gives people a meaningful break as we go into to late summer, fall, and winter. Got it. It was that, that part-timer patchwork availability that I was uh, not understanding. Thanks. Right. And, and you know, on the surface, this is one of those learnings. You know, it really, you know, in a lot of counties are going through this. That really sounded like, like it was great. A whole bunch of people, a stable full of folks that are ready to go. Um, in reality, people had other work. Um, if they weren't used when they were on rotation, um, sometimes they felt then, oh, I guess I'm not needed anymore. And then when they were called again, their next rotation was like, oh, I thought I was off the hook. You know, last week you told me you didn't need me. And so I've got something else to do. 
Um, even with, with the best of intentions, they and their manager, it became very, very challenging um, and, and expanding that stable of part-time people would have actually exacerbated the problem, uh, not relieved it with, with more limited part-time people. And so this, this looks like it will be a, a very meaningful and workable. We will still maintain uh, a group of standby emergency people in case we have one of these unfortunate giant outbreaks like uh, our sister counties have, have encountered. Uh, we'll keep a large group of people trained that will be able to pull in in emergencies, but not having to rely on that on a day-by-day -day basis will actually relieve a lot of the air traffic control and personnel management that's had to go on on a day-by-day -day basis so far. Well, that, 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 Thank you, that's helpful. That's uh, great news, uh, Charlie, and I uh, look forward to um, hearing you have the plan and just ha how it uh, works in uh, operation. But uh, you, you folks are definitely overdue for some help, and, and this uh, it, it sounds like you've managed to get by so far, and, and uh, the cavalry is coming. You can see him over the hill, and uh, that's uh, that's a good sign. So keep us posted, commissioners. Just yeah, uh, I think we're I think we're on about Plan D at this point, but <laughs> and there will probably be an E, F, and G, but we'll keep you posted. Great, commissioners. Just to clarify, uh, these positions are what we call 60-day emergency hire positions. Okay. Uh, we do have that uh, flexibility under our uh, current policies. And uh, we also have the ability to extend them for another 60 days. Uh, so that's how we're going about increasing our capacity so quickly, is through the 60-day hire process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Danielle. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Um, the only thing that I'll add to Dave and Charlie's um, communication are the public health branches at EOC are continuing to work on a mask plan, a mask distribution plan specific to community-based organizations. Um, we have had a pallet, two pallets of masks and, a, and boxes and sanitizers transferred to the public health storage area for public health to be able to distribute those to the community-based organizations that are serving our at-risk population. Um, Additionally, we are working, we had a conversation um, with several Corvallis PD and city folks at the end of last week around the homeless encampment. So we're working on some planning around the management and oversight of how to better address the needs of the individuals that are living in those um, homeless encampments that have grown since the beginning of the COVID emergency and are clearly needing some, some support and some um, cleanup. So, we have a first kind of internal meeting today, and we will continue to be working on that with the city and Corvallis Police Department as their planning move, moves forward. We are working closely with Joel Goodwin from CPD to try and address the needs. As you guys know, there was a fire there about a week and a half, yeah. two weeks ago, that was uh, very concerning. Um, so that's what prompted these conversations and the need for additional planning and support. All right. Uh, any questions for uh, Danielle? Uh, Zan? Yes, I have one question. I know that uh, one of our very active local um, community volunteers worked with the city uh, parks and rec and with the railroad to and with the homeless community to have a cleanup um, mm -hmm. along the stretch of um, the railroad that goes through Avery Park, uh, Pioneer Park. Um, do you have any information about that and how it went? I know that our um, eight, um, uh, harm reduction team also was a participant. Yeah, what I understand is they um, moved quite a lot of garbage and refuse from that area. The city parks um, person, Jude Geist, I believe his name is, mm -hmm. indicated they have that blocked off to prevent camping from re recurring there. Mm -hmm. um, they have put up some barriers to, to save that space since they've just put in all the the effort and time to clean it. Um, I did write down how much he said they removed, but it was it was quite a lot. Um, 
they also are worried about some of the water wastewater areas yeah. and uh, Willamette, the Willamette River. So um, that was the other part of the prompting for these conversations around those homeless encampments. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Danielle? All right, uh, thank you for your report. Uh, next up is uh, George Looney and the financials for, for the EOC. And uh, uh, Joe sent out an email earlier this morning with, with the spreadsheet. So take it away, George. Good morning. We are reviewing the expenses for the week ending 717. However, I'll probably spend most of my time on activity that's happened since then. The week of 717 was was a virtual week again for the EOC, so the expenses, the majority of expenses again were personnel. There was about $3,500 of other expenses throughout the county outside of EOC activities, uh, and those can be various things. Uh, I don't actually have the detail on those. A lot of times they're reopening type expenses or or things along those lines. So uh, the other thing that was significant for the week of the 17th is I did reconcile our estimated payroll to actual, which raised our payroll expense by just under $5,000, it was $48.95. And that's something we just do on a regular basis to true it up to, to what our actual expenses are, which is why the 214s and, and all of that reporting is so important to us that, that they get tired of hearing me say. but. Uh, <laughs> So that's really the expense side for the EOC. Now, the, the things that have happened since then, and you'll see these over the next couple of weeks because of the way we do our reporting, but we have more information on funding than we do on expenses, which is kind of unusual for me. Normally, I'm so focused on expenses. But this, this week, and, and Mary, I know, is on the line and can jump in if I get these these mixed up or, or something because we've been doing our communication through email that we did receive what our CARES Act allocation is, is how I understand it. And we were allocated um, $2.681 million. And my understanding is that the first million fifteen we requested comes out of that and that we have since requested another 900000 and we will continue to make requests now on a monthly basis up to that 2.68 million. So that's um, that's my understanding of the CARES Act. But Mary, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, George, the first one one million doesn't count in the 2.6. So we it's all a 3.7 million. Excellent. That's even better news. And, but the 900 will come out of that as we move forward. Correct. Great. So that's the CARES Act piece. We also, and I know Kate is on, um, and she may be able to address this more, but we also received notice that we did get $85,000 from Business Oregon for economic development, which I now understand is more of a match to what the county had already submitted. So that, that was good news. And in addition from public health, we are going to receive $1,104.58 per positive test that occurs within Benton County. So currently that's up to about $134,000. So those are all, will all be funding sources that you'll see kind of popping up on the graphs that, that we send out on a weekly basis as they, they come in. So. That really is a presentation that I had, if, and I would address, would entertain any questions. Okay, well, that, that uh, Zan. Um, I'm assuming that that $1,104 per positive test is uh, uh, the state's support for contact tracing and uh, containment? I believe that is true. But, this is Charlie, Commissioner. This is a new uh, case rate that's been created. Again, it's out of state CARES Act funding. Um, you know, we we have never really been able. TB is the only uh, other disease that we get a reimbursement for uh, 
per case. So there's very few billing opportunities in communicable disease. Uh, this is a new one for, and this is through December 31st at this point, unless there is further federal funding, uh, that's when this will end, but we'll be doing that. We'll back bill everything from now and then uh, be billing on a monthly basis uh, to the end of the year. And um, how does this compare to the case rate uh, funding for TB? Oh, it, it is significantly higher. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is much more realistic. Thank you. Um, it's Sorry. still, you know, it, it varies. The intensity per case really varies the actual cost, but this is a much more realistic uh, rate than than any any communicable disease funding public health has ever received. Thank you. Well, uh, it looks like. Uh, Kate Porsche is uh, still with us. Do you have any comments, Kate, on the um, Business Oregon uh, dollars? Hey, good morning, everybody. I think uh, my only comment is just to say how happy I am that uh, that we've procured these dollars um, in round three. The great news is this is a 100% match of the funds that uh, that you all had put up, so 85,000 to your 85,000, so we'll have $170,000 available um, for our small businesses. Um, I've sent on the information to Mary Otley so she can execute the contract. And I think Business Oregon is looking to get the money um, out the door um, in the next handful of weeks. They're going to give us two weeks to market this, uh, really get the word out, and then we've got some deadlines on getting the money out the door. So just just really excited that our maybe our, our tenacity has paid off and that we've, we've got these funds in this program available for, for our businesses in Benton County that need it so badly. So you call this uh, round three. Uh, I, I remember uh, a while back, uh, Benton County put in $100,000 and got a $50,000 match from Business Oregon. Is that correct? Uh, no, we put in an we put in an application for for round one, in coordination with the city of Albany. And the city right. of Albany received some funds, but then oh, the county did not. Right. But then round two was not for cities and counties, but was for the um, the finance partners. So our partners at Dev Northwest applied and received some money for uh, the Benton County area, which they have not rolled out yet because the notion was to wait until round three came about. And then round three is the round where we've received some funds. So the good news is we will have the round two funds from Community Lending Works that they have earmarked for our area plus the round three to really kind of roll it out all at once that we're, we're pretty excited. And on the heels of that, just to confuse things a little more, we have our community development block grant funds that, that you guys approved the application for, for both the county and the city. Those are slightly different funds um, in the way that they can be used. But I, the point I'm trying to make is that forthcoming, we're going to have a, a couple different pots of funding for folks. I'm building up a grid. Mary had suggested I thought it was a great idea. I'm going to build up a little grid so we all and you all can keep track of the different pots of funds and the, the folks that can are, are eligible for each of those pots as we're getting getting the word out. Great. And, and I'd love to see a chart. I, uh, it's easy to lose track which uh, pot of money we're talking about, but it, as long as it's coming in, uh, at least as fast as it's going out, we're, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good report. Uh, do we have uh, any more questions for uh, George or Kate? Uh, just a quick comment. You know, I think that uh, it's interesting that so many small pots of money coming in for economic development. Um, the need is large, uh, and it's such a, a, a dribble in some ways. But I'm very grateful for every bit of it that we're getting uh, to help our businesses make it through uh, this uh, really tight time. Um, and I just wanted to comment that I think that the match that you're referring to, Commissioner Malone, was uh, actually from the Oregon Community Foundation, and it came through directly to Dev Northwest um, to help um, match some of the funding that we put out in round one. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else on, on the financial side of things? 
Uh, hearing none, we will um, go to our colleagues at the Council of Governments. Um, I see uh, Ryan is with us and Randy Moore. So I'm not sure. Um, it's uh, this is the your quarterly update and and welcome, Ryan. It was nice uh, talking with you last week and now that you're an old timer you've almost got two weeks officially on the job and uh, so I, I assume things are running smoothly now. Good morning commissioners and thank you so much for having me today. Uh, yes, uh, almost two weeks on the job right now. The staff here at the COG are amazing and I'm really enjoying the ride. A um, handful of you uh, I think have upcoming appointments to uh, spend a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with me as I get to really understand uh, individual personalities and uh, local community issues. So it's been quite the whirlwind. I'm, I'm somewhere between two and four uh, electeds per day that I'm having conversations with to really get to know everything and spending the day out in Toledo tomorrow. So uh, we're on our way and I'm very excited to be on board. Um, but don't feel like you have to wait for me. If you have uh, things you want to chat about, feel free to give me a buzz, and I'm happy to do that. In the interest of time, I'm not going to belabor this. I'm just happy to be on board. I will send it over to Randy for uh, programmatic updates, but um, wanted to make sure you saw my face without a mask. So a number of uh, months from now when we're hopefully all able to navigate without masks, you know who I am. So thank you very much. Happy to be on board. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, go ahead, Randy. Good morning, commissioners. It's very nice to see everyone today. Um, I am officially going to give a stand by me update because the last time I came to visit you, we um, <laughs> were sort of regrouping with the change in leadership of that program and um, trying to gain a little more men momentum than we had uh, since the fall. And so I'm happy to provide an update to you today about that. We have accomplished a huge amount of work in the last two months, and so I wanted to share the good news about that. We actually have our first coaches training. So for those that don't know, Stand By Me is a financial empowerment program where we embed coaches and partner organizations to serve the communities. Um, and Benton County generously provided us with some funding, so we were going to focus on Benton County as our initial launch spot. But this is a re sort of, um, recreating a program that was created in Delaware and bringing it to Oregon. So we have our first coaches training next week where we have eight coaches or coach supervisors who are going to be going through the coaches training. That uh, is exciting because out of those eight people that are going to be taking the training, we have three that are going to be confirmed as embedded coaches in partner organizations, and that's going to be with Kidco Head Starts with strengthening rural families and one uh, in our organization that is going to be serving, we're going to be reaching out to the long-term care communities in Benton County and asking to help support their staff um, as well as potentially consumers if that's our residents of those facilities, if that's interesting to them. But knowing that those staff are um, pretty regularly um, switching positions, moving from facility to facility because of low incomes and low stability in their financial resources, we thought that that was a great population to serve. We also have some vet services organization uh, people going through the coaches training next week because one of our future hopes is that we would have a vet specific embedded coach. And we have a, a meeting that we're trying to get set up with the three county vet services officers as well as Kyle Hatch from Samaritan. Uh, he's their vet services worker there. And through CSC, they have a vet services officer that we're going to try to work with and try to get um, something working where we can all partner to have a coach embedded that would serve those vets of our counties. Um, I'm very excited that we are in the final stages of approving a Stand By Me webpage. It doesn't have a lot of information on it yet, but it's just talking about the fact that we're launching the program here 
encouraging people who would be interested in betting a coach to reach out to us or if uh, you are interested in funding or going through a coach's training that we would love to talk to you and try to build more relationships with that. We also have a Stand By Me logo for Oregon specifically and we're starting to work on developing our brochures. Um, we have submitted uh, two grants, one to the Oregon Community Foundation. That's the one I am most excited to talk to you about today because we actually had a phone call with the Oregon Community Foundation the other day. Mary Louise McClintock, who's their Senior Education Strategy and Policy Advisor, uh, we talked to her. They actually already support strengthening rural families, so it was, had some good synergy in that conversation. They like that organization. And though right now, Oregon Community Foundation is really focusing a lot on COVID, they uh, wanted us to uh, talk about the fact that in January, they're going to be get, getting back to more of their regular funding cycles and she really pretty clearly said we should uh, submit an application in January because it felt like it was perfect in alignment with the populations that they serve. So we're excited about getting that up and running. We also, as I said, supported an application or sent an application into the Collins Foundation and we are doing other letters of intent and reaching out to other grant, um, grantees, grantors, sorry. Um, I would like to provide a brief update. If you don't remember, uh, for COG to manage this program and actually apply for grant funding, we had to create a nonprofit board. That's called the Cascades West Community Development Corporation. And uh, part of that is creating a, a, a finding some board members, recruiting some board members for that group. And at first I was having a hard time, you know, those people who are proactive and active in the communities are, are spread pretty thin. And I was having some hard time. Thank you, Commissioner Ozero, for providing some opportunity to hook up with some people. But now we have our first six members. That was what I was hoping for for this first year because it is a rotating cycle of two year service. So I'm hoping that with those first six that we would be able to serve for this first year uh, our COG board needs to approve those and I, those people, and I hope that that will happen in August with our first um, board meeting to happen soon after that. Um, I could provide those board member names if you're interested, but otherwise I'll just say that we're excited and move forward with getting the board up and running. That PWCDC, Cascades West Community Development Corporation Board, would not only potentially serve Stand By Me, that's the only project that we're running through it right now, but we would consider if there are other programs that support uh, our counties in some kind of community and economic development, improving the well-being and financial security of all of the communities that they could be run through that board as well. Um, I do want to prepare you that Mary Otley is working on trying to get a new intergovernmental agreement that I provided to her to you for approval. Uh, between conversations between Commissioner Ogero and myself, we felt that the last government intergovernment agreement that was created was a lot about considering launching this program, talking about launching this program, and not actually taking some steps to launch this program. And so we've changed the language to say we will have embedded coaches in our community um, you know, before the fall. And I'm excited to say that I think that we are on the track for having that happen. Actually, I, I'm hoping we're going to start seeing our first consumers as early as August. So uh, be looking for that. She's, Mary's going to bring that to you on August the 4th. I would be happy to answer any questions at that time if you have them or before then or after then uh, before your approval of that intergovernmental agree agreement. We had stopped invoicing um, because of the lack of movement that we were experiencing in managing the program. And I am asking now that we could potentially uh, move forward with going ahead and invoicing again um, for the Stand By Me program, given the strides that we've made. The good news is we hope that we would take some of those funds and actually um, use them to support the Strengthening Rural Families Coach. And I think that's all I have uh, to share. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I just want to say I'm really thrilled with the progress that you've made in the last uh, two months um, on the Stand By Me program. As you know, it's uh, near and dear to my heart, and I am very much looking forward to um, seeing uh, the launch of client visits and um, moving forward with the program. 
If there's anything I can do to help with the fundraising efforts, uh, I will be more than happy to uh, be alongside you all uh, when it comes to speaking to the funders. Thank you, Commissioner. You have been such an advocate. Uh, any other uh, questions for Randy or uh, Ryan? Well, that, that's... I will tell you, Curtis Nelson is also on the line, Commissioners. Yep. Uh, we did submit a, a report for yep. the Benton Services. Uh, I'm sorry, the Veteran Services for Benton County, and he would be happy to answer any questions you have or provide any information. Okay. Oh. Good morning. Thanks for having me today. Um, so you guys have my report, and I just kind of want to report back and say uh, our overall number for interviews for this last quarter was at 166, which is slightly above our average, uh, a, a positive note during this time. Uh, we are still advocating and serving veterans remotely with interview options via uh, phone and Zoom. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the report or veteran services. Uh, Zan? Uh, CW, I know that um, there was a, a bit of a challenge there, a bottleneck, because of the fact that um, State VA was not seeing people and there wasn't an opportunity for um, some of those uh, uh, applications you all were putting in for benefits to be approved by the state. So how is that going? Has that changed at all? Yeah, a couple things have changed about that. So what, what um, Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs and what the VA had done to try to stop that bottleneck was they allowed us to, with verbal authorization, to type a signature for a veteran when we submitted forms. Um, so that was helping the process, but unfortunately they, they rescinded that option. Mm -hmm. And so now we, we don't have that option. So, so it's going to kind of bottleneck uh, our, some of our veteran processes again. But uh, on a positive note, the, the, when you submit a claim and, and, a, and a veteran is is going forward with a, you know, a condition or a disability uh, application. Uh, the CMP exams where, where the veteran goes in and gets reviewed for those conditions, they've opened those back up in Oregon. They were shut down for almost three months. So uh, they're open now and, and we're starting to see our veterans move forward with that. But, but unfortunately on, on, the, on the front end of that with the signatures, that's where the bottleneck is now at this point. And then, I do want to highlight too, in regards to the um, the report that we provided you all. Um, the unfortunate part with that is is ODVA is, is working from home as well, and, and majority of the VA is, and so they're not getting the mail, or ODVA is not getting the mail uh, on a consistent basis from the VA. So they're not going in and updating our system. So when we go and pull reports and and we look at the recoveries and, and the monthly retros, um, those numbers are very far off because they're not updating with, with what, what is happening in real time. So unfortunately, that some of those, most of those numbers are not accurate at this time. Mm. That's a challenge. It is. And I, I know that you were also planning on collaborating with our joint information system uh, team to put together a video for um, veterans here in our service area. Um, has that, have you managed to figure out a schedule for that? Yeah, no, um, I, I emailed Alyssa again the other day regarding that. So we have uh, our script per se, and we have the individual who's going to do it. We're just waiting for that opportunity to, to be able to do that, and then and we'll get that information out. We do, uh, you guys will be seeing a, uh, a newspaper ad coming out soon. That's been approved, so we're, we're moving forward with that. So that should be coming out here fairly quickly. All right. Uh, any other uh, questions for CW? Well, uh, I appreciate the efforts in these uh, challenging times and, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to your next update and, and ho hope that uh, the state will pick up the pace a little bit. That, yes, sir, that is, that is the hope. Um, you know, we're, we're continuously 
um, evolving and trying to, to change and, and make it easier for our veterans. Another thing that I would like to kind of highlight, I think a lot of you probably already know, but Molly Murphy, one of our uh, veteran service officers, she is fully accredited at this point through uh, Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs. So now she is able to sign paperwork and, and help our veterans in, in every way possible officially. So that's exciting news. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Any, any last uh, questions for our uh, COG friends? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on uh, to the Oregon Department of uh, Forestry and uh, welcome uh, to uh, Mike uh, Gran and uh, another uh, new face here that uh, I, I don't know. You 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 started first of July, is that right, Mike? Uh, yeah, started June twenty second. No, oh, so. Oh, you're an old timer now. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I got a full month under my belt, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm good to go. And uh, so, uh, well, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I uh, thank you, commissioners, for letting us come speak with you this morning. Um, kind of the goal of today is to uh, have us talk about our habitat conservation plan and the planning process, and. Uh, we'd like to get some feedback uh, from the commissioners on the process and keep you engaged moving forward as much as we can and as much as you're interested in. So that's kind of the goal of today. And then also kind of want to um, allow a few minutes after the HCP um, discussion and just see if there's any additional questions that you have outside of that um, for us specifically, whether it pertains to our private forest program or our protection program, since we are in the heart of fire season right now. Yeah. So, um, so for the record, my name is Michael Curran. I'm the new district forester for the West Oregon District of the Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, I am joined by a few other folks, and I can't see some of them on my end, so I'm going to introduce them, and I'm assuming they're on. Yep. So joining us today is Andy White. He's the Northwest Oregon Area Director. Um, Andy, are you on? Yes. Okay. And uh, Liz Dent, our State Forest Division Chief, um, she'll be presenting the HCP um, to you um, after I get done through my portion. And then uh, Brett Brownscombe, he's with Oregon Consensus, and he's part of our HCP planning team. So I don't see Brett, so I don't know if he's yep. on or not yet. I am, Michael. Hi, everybody. Morning. Okay. So uh, I think with that, before we get started with the HCP process, so, you know, I'll kind of just give a quick ground of the West Oregon District. And um, so the West Oregon District encompasses uh, Benton, Polk, Lincoln, the southern half of Yamhill, and the extreme southern portion of Tillamook County. You know, we administer her, uh, three main programs out of our office. Um, the first one program. So we protect just shy of 1.1 million acres in the district. Um, and we do that with uh, a 24 person seasonal fire crew. And then um, we also administer our uh, state forest program and we manage uh, a little over 36,000 acres of state owned forest land. And for Benton County specifically, um, there's 8,327 acres of board of forestry lands and then 553 acres of common school lands. And as I'm sure you guys are aware with the board of forestry owned lands, um, those are the lands that provide revenues to the counties. So, and then we also administer our private forest program, uh, where we uh, are in charge of administering the Forest Practices Act um, for forest landowners um, that want to manage their lands. So, we also have a pretty robust fuels reduction program um, that we utilize federal grant dollars with, and that's helping create sensible space. Um, around homes that are in that urban interface area. Uh, we've been very active in that program for the last 10 years, um, and we're continuing to get funds for that, and it's been a pretty popular program locally uh, with a lot of your constituents. So uh, we've got across the district, we do all that work with 25 permanent staff, 
um, amongst all the programs. And then, as I mentioned, we have a 24 person seasonal fire crew um, that we employ that helps us out during fire season. So um, that is the very high level 30,000 foot <laughs> of the background of our district. Um, there's definitely a lot more we do. And if you guys have any more further questions with those programs, um, maybe we can answer those at the end. But uh, I do want to allow enough time so we can discuss the HCP. So um, I'll go ahead and move on to Andy White. He'll kind of talk about um, kind of how Northwest Oregon area and, and all the state forest plans that fall within that um, and kind of the context the HCP has with that um, locally within Benton County. So. Andy? All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Commissioner, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. So for the record, my name is Andy White. I'm the Northwest Oregon Area Director uh, with the Department of Forestry. And in, in my role, I'm responsible for the oversight of those programs that Michael just mentioned across uh, five districts in, in Northwest Oregon. And that covers about by about 12 counties. And so geographically, start in the southern end of the area, that includes portions of uh, Lincoln and Lynn County, uh, moving north uh, between the coast and the Cascades, clear up to the Columbia River. And, uh, and obviously, Benton County fits within that footprint. And Michael is, is one of the managers of those five districts. Uh, we also have the Tillamook District, the Astoria District, uh, Forest Grove and North Cascade districts uh, with uh, uh, district foresters uh, uh, performing in similar roles as Michael. Um, in addition, we also have the agency's uh, Education Interpretation Center, the Tillamook Forest Center. Uh, that lies within the Northwest Oregon area footprint, as does uh, the South Fork uh, Adults in Custody uh, Camp, where we're co-located with the uh, Department of Corrections and a unique uh, relationship there where we utilize about 10 to 14 minimum security crews uh, each day accomplishing work on uh, state forest lands and uh, you know as Michael mentioned uh, the, the state forest ownership in Northwest Oregon that is one of the responsibilities that we have and uh, there's about 580,000 acres of state forest ownership that falls within the Northwest Oregon area um, and, and so that's obviously a big interest to me and um, kind of ties back into the habitat conservation planning efforts, uh, the emphasis there and the importance of that process. So I just wanted to provide a really quick overview and then yield uh, uh, the majority of the time to Liz Dent, our State Forest Division Chief, uh, so she can provide an update on that habitat conservation plan uh, planning effort. Liz? Great. Thank you, Andy. Good morning, Commissioners. I want to start off by expressing my appreciation uh, to you all uh, for your public service in this incredibly trying and taxing time. I know that um, based on just a little bit of the conversation I heard this morning, you have a lot of really pressing, important issues uh, in your county that you're managing. So thank you very much for spending some time with us today to talk about forestry. It probably feels a little bit like a side burner topic given everything else that you're handling. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Liz, it's nice to so see you, you again. Uh, Haven't seen you for a while. Uh, pardon me? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I haven't seen you for a while. It's good to see you. Yes. Good morning, Commissioner. Good to see you too. Uh, we're still working on it. <laughs> Commissioner Jaramillo has been working on some of this stuff, uh, had worked on it when she was serving on the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee, uh, and it's been ongoing for quite a while. So for the record, my name is Liz Dent, and I serve as the State Forest Division Chief, as Andy said, and wanting to just spend a little bit of time here this morning talking to you about some really significant policy work of the Board of Forestry. Um, the topic of today is really about um, the guiding document uh, for the decisions that we make for managing these forests uh, from year to year and from decade to decade. And those are called forest management plans. We have several forest management plans right now depending on where we are in the state. 
What the board has asked us to do is look at a revision to our forest management plan to do two things, to improve conservation outcomes and to improve financial viability. And that really is a tall task. It is, um, it's common that those two things are in conflict with each other, to be quite honest. Um, and then of course, we have a range of stakeholders that probably put different values on, on conservation outcomes um, and financial outcomes. So the board, because it is so difficult, the board has been working on this since about 2012. Um, the scope, so Andy talked a little bit, we've, we're scaling up, if you will. So we started off with the district, your county as it fits in our West Oregon district. Andy talked about the Northwest Oregon area. The scope of this work that the board is doing is actually looking at everything from the Columbia River uh, in the north uh, west corner of the state down of the state down to the California border and we did send you a handout excuse me that that shows a map of that that geographic area that we're proposing to cover under one forest management plan at the same time as the board has asked us to work on a forest management plan they've also asked us to work on a habitat conservation plan and that and Michael opened up nicely saying that's one of the things that's really what we want to talk to you about today. One thing I do just want to take a minute to, to emphasize is that the management objectives and um, statutory mandate for managing these lands is what we call greatest permanent value. And you may hear this reference in shorthand as GPV. Um, and it's really about long-term management of these lands over time and across the landscape to provide for a range of social, uh, economic, and environmental benefits to the people of Oregon. And that really means healthy, productive forests, uh, high quality air and water quality, um, providing for social benefits. Andy touched a little bit on recreation and education that we provide across our ownership. Um, and so it's a whole suite of benefits. Uh, that the public has come to rely on. And I think that we're unique in our ability to do that on state forests as compared to some other ownerships, either on the private end of the spectrum or on the federal end of the spectrum. We do this with active management. We do not receive any general funds, so the funding for our program is completely from the sale of timber with the exception of a few grants and some pass-through money for our, our uh, off-road vehicle program. Um, with the timber revenue we bring in, about 64% is distributed to the counties before covering our operational costs. Um, we consider that revenue distribution to the county to be a really important um, social benefit. We also manage uh, common school forest land, as Michael characterized. That's a that's a different mandate. Um, it's but it's very similar and it's overlapping. It's, it's characterized as the greatest benefit consistent with resource conservation and land and sound land management strategies. And so we manage those lands. Those are owned by Department of State Lands and we manage them under a management agreement with DSL. The revenue from those, from the management of those lands goes to the Common School Fund. So that's just a background. That's the context within which we're managing and within that context, the board has said to look for ways to improve conservation and financial outcomes. So why pursue a habitat conservation plan? There are a number of ways to comply with the Federal Endangered Species Act. The um, Federal Endangered Species Act identifies species that are have different levels of um, threat to uh, their persistence. And so typically we'll talk about threatened and endangered species. And um, in order to comply with the Endangered Species Act, which there are two, there's the state federal, ES, there's the state ESA and the federal ESA. So in this case, we're focused on the federal ESA. There's several ways to comply. And uh, I group them into two buckets. One is programmatic ESA compliance and the other is what's called take avoidance. At this moment, we're managing with what's called take avoidance. And what that means is any time that we are 
planning a timber harvest or a road construction or even a restoration project, we evaluate the habitat conditions and if it looks like those habitat conditions would support um, a threatened or endangered species in our ownership, it's typically marbled murrelets and northern spotted owls. We do a biological assessment and we um, work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate the potential risk to the species. And so with that, we call those operational surveys. And it ends up being what I would characterize as inefficient and inexpensive. We spend close to $2 million a year on these surveys. Sometimes partway through the planning process, we discover uh, occupied habitat and then uh, the plans kind of go out the door and we start again. So it's inefficient and inexpensive. The benefit of a habitat conservation plan is it's a long-term agreement, in this case with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we're also seeking coverage for some fish species and salamanders. It's a long-term agreement with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries. And that long-term agreement, in this case, we're seeking, we're hoping for a 70-year agreement. And in that agreement, it establishes the conservation measures that we're going to put on, on the ground to contribute to the persistence of the species and conservation uplift as compared to what we're doing now. And in exchange, so to speak, we have uh, assurances to manage this land base for 70 years. It's sort of an insurance policy. Um, and its benefit cannot be, um, cannot be overstated. Uh, right now, the uncertainty associated with take avoidance, so not only is it expensive and, and inefficient, but we're subject to what's called third-party lawsuits. And in fact, right now, we are um, defending a case uh, from an environmental, uh, a group of environmental um, conservation groups that are claiming that our practices are causing take of coho. With an HCP, uh, we, in exchange for these long-term commitments, assurances to manage, the, the, um, the um, controversy, if you will, ends up being between the services and whoever would bring a lawsuit, in this case, um, some conservation groups. And so it steps us away from that conflict, um, which again is expensive, defending against litigation is expensive. And were we to lose that case, or even if uh, the judge uh, that would potentially, um, could potentially decide to, to do what's called enjoin timber sales that have been named in that lawsuit, overnight we could um, completely stop harvesting of those sales that have been listed in that litigation. So the uncertainty is overwhelming. The other problem with take avoidance is that um, we can anticipate more and more species occurrence on the landscape, which means more and more reduction in the areas that we're able to manage. And we also know that there's a handful of species that we anticipate are going to be listed in the near future. And we are seeking coverage under an HCP for those species as well. So with that, we would have a commitment with the services where we say, here's what we're going to do for conservation so that in the event these species are listed, an example is red tree bull, we already have our commitment with the services. And, and, that, and, and that stands the test of time. So it's really a, a really powerful tool. And I guess I, I like to really emphasize it's about certainty. And that certainty um, translates into um, benefits for rural communities, specifically revenue um, generation and, and uh, distribution to the counties. Um, so those, those were the main points I wanted to make about um, what an HCP is, why we think it's beneficial. Um, just to give you a little bit more on what we're proposing, we're pretty, we've made significant progress on the HCP this year. And uh, we're proposing to cover in that ownership from the North Coast down to the Southern, down to the border with California, 635,000 acres. 
and uh, covers 16 terrestrial and aquatic species. Um, it's a landscape approach, so it integrates both conservation strategies uh, with other um, goals for managing the landscape. And it designates a portion of the landscape that would be focused on conservation for both terrestrial and aquatic species. And at this point, we're estimating that to be somewhere between 48 and 52 percent of the land of the landscape. The um, the approaches to managing again the entire landscape, including the areas outside of those areas that are being managed for terrestrial and aquatic species, um, also provide uh, benefits for uh, other native species, as well as uh, air and water quality, cultural resources, recreation, public and public access. Any HCP has to have a companion forest management plan that covers all those other resources because the HCP focuses simply on those listed species. So that's a fairly significant portion of the landscape focused on conservation. We've begun, we've got a draft a set of outcomes that we think would flow from that type of approach. And we, I would anticipate at this point, and please know these numbers are subject to change, that this will equate to a reduction in harvest levels across the landscape um, to the tune of somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Um, so it's not minor. It, it is a reduction in harvest. But I want to emphasize that I have every expectation that without an HCP, our harvest levels will go down. And so the question at hand for the Board of Forestry and for the engagement of, of commissioners um, as, our, as our partners and holding a special and recognized relationship with the division and the agency is really around uh, managing risk, increasing certainty, um, and a recognition that with or without an HCP, we are heading into an era where our harvest levels are likely going to go down. And, that's be and that would be a result uh, largely of an increasing number of occurrences of threatened endangered species um, or uh, additional species being listed. So with that, um, I will take a breather and answer whatever questions that I can. Uh, Liz, how long has this process been going on now? I know that I'd start, I've, I've been watching it kind of at a distance on, 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 the, on your website, but uh, now it seems to be going uh, pretty uh, aggressively. Am I, am I correct about that? That's exactly right, Commissioner. We, um, as you know, we started around 2012 with mostly focused on the forest management plan. And in November of 2018, we brought a business case to the Board of Forestry for them to evaluate if they thought it was in the best interest of the state to pursue an HCP. So that was really their first major decision to tell us to, yes, go ahead and start working on an HCP. And so we did so. And now in this October, We'll be going back to them with these results that I started sharing with you, the, ha the, the habitat conservation areas, riparian conservation areas, and potential outcomes uh, for greatest permanent value. So we'll be framing it in terms of social, economic, and environmental benefits to the people of Oregon. So it has been much more intensive for the past couple of years. We've got a really neat structure where we've got two teams organized uh, one is made up of my counterparts from the federal agencies, as well as ODSW, DEQ, Department of State Lands, and we've got um, a, a person from OSU on that team. And then there's a, a counter to part to that team, which is the technical staff from those same agencies. So those technical staff have really been digging in, doing the hard work to put these proposals together. And then those proposals go to the steering committee for review and approval. So that there's alignment between the technical staff and the policymakers for these agencies. 
And so what we're asking the board to think about in, and decide on really in October is do they want us to take the next step? So the first step was determining it's in the best interest of the state, draft up an HCP. The second step is do you want us to move, keep moving and go into the federal NEPA process? Um, and if they say yes to that, then their final decision, which is going to be probably a year and a half or more after that, would be if they would actually approve a habitat conservation plan. So still a couple years to go, Commissioner. His hands, hands up. Uh -oh. uh, oh. I, um, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It, uh, this is a, a nice, short, and sweet presentation relative to the long seminar that occurred a couple weeks ago. and. Um, <laughs> I know that there's so much behind uh, all of this in terms of all the process regulations as well as the kind of geographic specific uh, uh, management approaches that are envisioned uh, for riparian areas and for other areas of the forest. I have, I guess, a couple of different questions. One is um, I, I really do appreciate the fact that an HCP provides an insurance policy or a floor, if you will, and a lot of certainty for both environmental uh, community and the general public and for the timber community. And I, I think that's the right way to go. Um, but I, I, with the current, um, there's no good way to say this, but with the current administration and the um, efforts to weaken the Endangered Species Act and the NEPA process overall, um, I'm, I'm a little unsure about how well an HCP strategy will work to provide that level of certainty given that the federal environmental law is in such um, an uncertain state at the moment. Do you have any comments about that, especially given the long-term um, planning horizon for um, HCP adoption and Board of Forestry process and the forest management plans? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, a couple thoughts. One is, uh, should the board decide to go into the NEPA process, then one of the federal agencies decides to lead NEPA. And in this case, it is NOAA Fisheries has agreed to do that. Okay. And one of the benefits of that is that, um, although <laughs> I think it's changing, in fact, I, I know it is, um, it's a matter of if we're subject to it, but one of the reasons for doing that is that they were not yet um, uh, experiencing some of those changes in, in federal approaches to HCPs. Mm. Um, so some examples include, which I'm not sure if this is what you're referencing, but um, a restriction on the number of pages of a habitat conservation plan and the fact that it had to be done within a year. And so NOAA Fisheries was not subject to that. Um, that is changing, and so it's just a matter of if we got kind of our, our hat in the ring before that, because really HCPs are more complex and need, <laughs> typically need more than 100 pages and more than a year to complete. Right. If they are subject to that, we do have some ways of handling that with doing a bunch of work ahead of NEPA um, to, so that we can finish within that time frame before sort of the stopwatch starts and then there would be companion documents okay um that's good i'm glad that there are alternative strategies the other question i had was um given that about 48 to 52 percent of the landscape will be protected given the current vision and knowing that there are three different um regions envisioned in the HCP and that most of the forest land is up in that northern north coast area, most of the effects are going to fall in that north coast area. And um, so it's a matter not only of, you know, percentages, but where that percentage yeah. lands. And so um, I, I would say that I'm very supportive of the HCP process, but um, what, uh, what are you hearing from folks in that region about um, prospects? And um, does certainty win or does harvest win? Huh. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, just to confirm, you're exactly right. The biggest acreage designation at this point, and I want to emphasize this draft, <laughs> um, is in the North Coast area. 
and that's largely because we have our best habitat there and our most mm -hmm. records of occurrences mm -hmm. historically. Um, so that is a reality. The, um, I guess what I would say is, you know, we're hearing from some of the county commissioners uh, some consternation for sure um, around the, the reduction in revenue that would be associated with the drop in harvest level and not just revenue, but also timber related jobs and mm -hmm. concern about mill closures. Mm -hmm. so, um, so th that's real, and I'm really worried about that too. And that ultimately is what we're asked to balance under greatest permanent value. And also an HCP has to take that into consideration as well. And that's why I keep emphasizing that, some of, that this is draft, and we are still looking at, at some other ways to um, configure some of those to still meet the conservation objectives uh, but also address some of the concern around harvest levels. I am very clear, though, that harvest levels will go down. Like, that is not going to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, there's, so there's that. And then, um, you know, purchasers are, are raising concerns as well um, about uh, reduced uh, inventory available for harvest. And so um, I, what I would say is those conversations are while they're while they have significant concerns around how much the harvest at this point we've estimated how much the harvest would decrease they do recognize the benefit of certainty mm -hmm. you know, that's in any business is wants certainty and so they we're definitely seeing both of those threads in the conversations with our purchasers and i would argue the same is true again i said this already but the same is true with revenue to the county having some certainty around what that's going to be for decades to come. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the, it, it's a challenging balancing act altogether. Uh, we do have a question from one of our um, participants on the sideline um, about whether or not the HCPs include carbon sequestration. It does. We're um, part of the evaluation that we're doing is to look at maybe you backing up a little bit when we go to answer your question just give me a little bit of background here to provide for you when we go to the board in October and ask them to decide if they want us to keep working on an HCP we're going to provide them with what's called a comparative analysis and in that analysis we're comparing our current forest management plan to a draft forest management plan that we had been working on since 2012 and it's sort of sidelined at the moment while we focus on the HCP to what would it look like under an HCP mm -hmm. so really giving them a, a really coarse estimate of outcomes that one might expect depending on which avenue they wanted us to go stay the same just revise the FMP and stick with take avoidance or use an HCP mm -hmm. and in that evaluation we'll be comparing um, carbon uh, storage across those three options. All right. Well, well good luck. <laughs> uh, Liz, I really appreciate the presentation. You've uh, distilled down a very complex uh, subject and, and g gave me a better understanding of how the uh, HCP fits into the big picture and, and how uh, uh, critical it is for getting some certainty in uh, what's been a very uncertain uh, business. Uh, uh, Zan? I have one last question, and I think it's as much for my fellow commissioners as it is for um, all of you from uh, ODF. Thank you for coming and presenting to us. Um, and that is about the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee and our role right now. Um, I, I'm not um, sure, Annabelle, are you still our representative on that? And um, how functional is that process for us to be able to I, I think Pat weigh is, in Pat and in convey the, think, our okay. uh, opinions? I think after the, la after the last conference, I think Pat, Pat has, was, I, I nominated Pat to sit on the committee. I don't think the committee has been very functional at all. Uh, they meet very early on uh, on a Monday morning once a month, and I don't even know if they're meeting. Now. I don't think they're meeting right now, so I, it's really hard to say. Uh, 
what's happening with that. And in fact, there's there there was also a, a another subcommittee with federal uh, dealing with federal forest lands, which I think has gone by the wayside at AOC. Uh, Pat, do you know any different, any more than that? Uh, I think that sums it up pretty well. I, I've attended uh, some of those meetings, and I didn't find them very uh, worthwhile. Uh, it uh, there was a pretty strong group. I remember maybe it was the first meeting where they spent most of the hour debating uh, the meaning of a couple words that were in the document and, and uh, didn't, didn't make much, much progress. So uh, I have not been uh, very active in that group. And I have one more comment. Uh, and Liz, I really appreciate the work that, that you guys are going through in terms of look at, looking at setting up, uh, you know, a good good recommendation for the habitat conservation planning process. As you know, Benton County did develop an H HCP several years ago for Fender's Blue Butterfly, and it took a long time to get to get get that in place. But I think it's been very valuable. Uh, um, it's given us great value in terms of how planning can go. And for when you're looking at, at a habitat conservation planning process. So I really admire you sticking with it. And uh, I'm sure the, the board will be, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the board decides. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I, I might just offer another thought on Forest Trust Lands Advisory Good. Committee. That's exactly right. They, they actually have not convened a meeting since December, which is one of the reasons that we have reached out to you all, and we're doing the same across all of the counties that would be covered under the HCP. And so um, it's really important for us to make sure you know what is going on and that we're here to answer any questions that you might have. And so I would just offer, we remain ready to do that. We can come back um, anytime. Michael obviously is a fantastic resource for you uh, locally, but um, I, I can't, I mean, I, I would definitely emphasize the, um, the, you know, really important um, relevance that this has uh, mm -hmm. for our communities across the state of Oregon and, and really, you know, with such a long-term aspect to it, how important it is for us to maintain communication with, with you commissioners. So we, so we want to keep doing that even if the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee is not meeting. And I'm not sure when they're going to meet again. It's hard to say. All right. Any other uh, questions on the HCP? I see Brett, Brett uh, Brownscomb is on. on. Did uh, It's good to see you again, Brett. And did you, were you going to present or you're just uh, uh, listening in? No, Commissioner, thanks. It's good to see you, too. I'm just listening in and um, part of the team kind of working externally to try to make sure there's a thread of connection between this process and commissioners. So I want to be part of any help with outreach or conversations that I can alongside with an ODS. Sounds great. Good to see you. It's been really great to have Oregon consensus with us, and then we've also hired uh, a couple of contractors to help with HCP development, as well as a facilitator um, organization, Kearns and West. And so we've really brought a lot of resources to the table. But uh, Brett's long history with natural resources in Oregon is is really an asset to us. He doesn't look any older. <laughs> <laughs> he's got twins, so he's got to be oh, feeling okay. tired. Okay. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Thanks for that. And no comment on the uh, own feeling. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate this uh, information and, and it makes when we get emails or uh, uh, further in information, uh, I think we'll have a better context to uh, pl plug that information into in this uh, long drawn out uh, process so uh, appreciate the timetable and uh, background and Mike you, your office looks familiar even though you're uh, a new guy I, I'm on the Benton County Forest Land uh, Forest uh, Classification Committee 
and so uh, get into uh, we actually had a physical meeting last March I think just before things tended to uh, close down so and uh, my wife and I have a tree farm so I'm uh, definitely uh, interested in this uh, subject on a, a personal level so uh, Great. Do we okay, have? thank you. Thanks. And I, uh, you know, and I'll throw out there, um, you know, just to see if you guys have any other questions just outside of the HCP um, project that we have going on that we can try to answer for you today. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions, uh, Mike, but I'm sure they will come up and we know where you are. I'm ready for another field trip. <laughs> We need another field trip. I know we, we can't do it right now, but it would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, and we, uh, I'm actually writing that down right now. Um, and I'll keep that on my list of things to do. And hopefully we can uh, get through this uh, pandemic that we're currently dealing with. And uh, we'll try to get something scheduled with you all um, when the appropriate time comes. So hopefully that's sooner rather than later. So. And I'll throw out there for you. Um, no, we can't really meet in person a whole lot right now, but please don't hesitate to give me a call if you ever need anything. Um, and when the time comes and we can start meeting in person, please reach out and uh, we can try to meet up and uh, talk as well. So, Well, uh, thank you for that. And I, I hope we have a nice, calm fire season coming up here. Oh. But. Uh, uh, I, I know you folks are ready, and uh, that's reassuring. And uh, thank you for um, bringing the whole whole crew, even though it's not in person. It, uh, it's nice to see familiar faces and new faces, and uh, we'll uh, continue this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next up, I see uh, Sean McGuire has joined us. Uh, I, I assume you're uh, ready to uh, give us an update on the resilient post COVID 19 economy. Um, Sean, and, and I see Lalia, are you uh, pitching in here also? Um, I am only pitching in in the form of an introduction, okay. um, but yes. <clears throat> well, take it so, away. Thank you, commissioners, much appreciated. So this morning, Sean McGuire is back before you, um, following up to a conversation that we had in June at your goal setting meeting as a brief reminder um, within the sustainability program and within our organization uh, you know we strongly believe that sustainability has um, is the three-legged stool plus that fourth leg of livability and so as part of our 2040 thriving communities initiative we've absolutely taken that perspective however um, following the first three months of the COVID pandemic really settling in in Oregon, Sean and I were discussing how do we advance um, not only in the sustainability program, but also within our 2040 work uh, in a post-COVID economy, truly. And so in June, we brought this topic to you all and you all uh, gave Sean the green light to go ahead and get out into the community and really do a listening tour with um, local businesses, um, cities, individuals who actually have experienced COVID-related job loss. And so what Sean is here to do today is to bring back um, a summary and an analysis of those interviews, those listening sessions to you. Because he was able to complete, I think, um, close to two dozen, I'll let him run through the interview list. What Sean and I have done for today is really focused on um, kind of setting the stage for you all. There are six questions that he asked all of his participants, and so the two 
two to three questions that have a bit more meat to them. Um, we are looking forward to coming back at August goal setting to um, hopefully spend a little bit more time getting into those analysis. So what Sean has for you today is a list of the interviewees and a summary and analysis of three of the questions of his conversation. Sean, take it away, buddy. Well, thanks for the introduction. And, and Sean, we have uh, 30 minutes for this uh, presentation. So take it away. Yes, sir. We will take it tight. Um, OK, thank you, Lilia. Appreciate that. Um, real quick, I did send this out earlier this morning. I apologize. Uh, as Lilia said, we had uh, 19 interviews that were incorporated into the report. That was 60 pages of notes, 30 pages of a summary, and you had six before you. So two things. One, you're welcome. And second, that, uh, again, as Lilia said, this is going to be very high level, and I apologize for it. It was not included in the packet. So those that are, did not receive it, I'll try my best to walk it through. So uh, as Lilia said, you asked me to go out on a listening tour. Um, and what you have before you is a very high level analysis of what would happen. So I just want to walk you through. So the, again, the intent was to uh, identify thought leaders. Um, we reached out to more than 20 and we had 19 interviews that were included into the report. Methodology was, uh, Lee and I came up with a first draft of the list. Uh, we worked with Kate and her office to see uh, if we missed anything and we, and we talked to people who they recommended. I did want to say that second point of we, in the interviews, it was supposed to be a conversation, and I'm very happy that most of them did turn into a conversation and not so wrote as to answer question by question. Uh, I did ask for their candor, so that second bullet there that uh, you do have a list of interviewees before you, but I, in the analysis, I'm not going to link up people to, uh, to specific comments. I, I really appreciated their candor, very similar to when we did the public engagement. The questions were intended to be very broad, and I'm glad they were because people took everything in a different direction. And so I had a very robust and broad perspective of how people thought of the economy and the broadest terms pre and post COVID. So uh, second, you have before you the list of individuals that I interviewed and is incorporated into the analysis. You see economic development, business, forestry, rural communities, equity uh, across the board really wanted to get, get as many voices as I can. Uh, I just super appreciated when I facilitated the 2040 and the public engagement, having people like Jim Gavea and Paul Smith really push. We know who the normal voices sound like. Where are those voices that we don't always reach out to? So you see that list um, on page two. You have the list of questions. I had two sets of questions, one for the 17 non-unemployed people, and you can see it and we'll walk through. And then a second list of questions for the unemployed. Uh, so we'll go through the first one. I want to stop right now. Did any questions so far? No? OK. So list of questions. The rationale behind this was, first and foremost, do you just want to go back to the way it was? And if I had 20 yeses, well, then this would be a much shorter conversation <laughs> with you all. Uh, the second was, what did we as an organization and community do positively and what did we do negatively? That's what 213 was. Just to kind of get a, did, where do we perform well, where do we not perform? Question four was to take question three and where are those gaps? Looking at a little more specific, question five was looking at a little bit broader at our industries, business, workforce, the integration. And then finally, the six was, what are these real big policy issues that we need to address if we want to resume? That was the forethought. I will be honest with you, as any conversation happens, people are kind of bouncing around. So in the analysis, I did move you know, quotes and comments around to the more appropriate category, but it was quite nice. It was, it was I, almost every single one was a very nice conversation, separate from this. And uh, obviously number seven is uh, just, is there something else you want to add? Most of the time it was incorporated into another section, as with any qualitative analysis. Any questions so far on that one? Okay. Then with the unemployed interviews, I thought it important. One of the things I really liked about um, you know, housing, hope, and these things, we can't talk about homelessness without talking about homeless people. Can't talk about the economy without talking to the 45% of our people that were unemployed over a weekend. 
So I talked to a couple of unemployed. In all full disclosure, they are my friends. Uh, we had a nice conversation. Uh, they were let go that first weekend, and those are the questions that I asked. Again, it turned more into a conversation. So the analysis includes all these questions and all of the responses per question. That was that 58, 60 page document that has everything, and then we called it down into a 30, which is still heady reading, uh, but hopefully somewhat more digestible. So for today, I just want to hit the super high tensions issues that came out. So before going on too much further, any questions? Okay. So the first question was, uh, if you look on page three, should we go back, should our local economy go back to where it was pre-COVID? Again, if everybody said yes, then be short. That is not what we heard. We uh, The way that it just kind of organized, we had three responses that there was so much transformational change that we can't, we just can't go back. There's just no way we can do that. We had nine responses say we shouldn't go back. And you can start seeing some of the quotes. Um, don't think that the previous economy benefited prosperity equitably. It was a volatile economy, um, income and racial disparities. There were other issues that our economy was having to trudge through. Even people who did want to go back are saying, hey, it wasn't perfect. We'll get to that uh, later. So at 12 of the 19 said either we can't go back or we shouldn't go back. And you can read some of the quotes for yourself. Then we got a couple that, you know what, no, but everything changes, which I really appreciate it. I appreciate the fact that they're like, you know what, something's always going to happen. Yesterday is not today, um, and we just need to deal with it. So those are the two, no, but that's how it should be. Then we have the yes buts. Uh, the yes buts are, yeah, we need to go back, but it really wasn't great. We still need to do better. It's going to take us a while, and again, as it says, we haven't even seen the worst part yet. So that was that kind of tempered yes, but let's fix some things. And then the last two were yes, and we need to make what we had stronger, um, kind of doubling down on what, what we were before we started. This kind of, it was interesting to not only know where these people came from and, and how the, uh, the responses were, but this just kind of gives, it, again, a very high-level picture of what the community thought of our previous economy and how we wanted to move forward. And again, I keep coming back to economy in the broadest sense. Housing issues, affordability issues, all this is not just business development. So uh, I just went through a lot of interview time in about two minutes. Any other questions, any questions or thoughts on so far? Okay. So this came into the actual analysis. You see before you on pages four and five, some of the really big picture topics that kind of came out. Again, very high level themes. So the first one was, well, that quote just, it hit because of so many people saying it shouldn't go back. That, yeah, we, we had a thriving economy as long as everything was fine. Everything is not fine. Let's try to make it fine. So the first one was just time, time to think big. Um, we don't have an opportunity like this. Uh, to have an economy shut down and an opportunity for a local government or a local community or regional to retool it as we come back does not, it literally comes once in a century, 1918 or a world war or something like that. Um, this doesn't come around every time. So as you see some of the comments here, there's no going back. Let's, let's take this opportunity not just to go back to normal. I do want to take one little side note. Uh, one of the one of the interviews started immediately by saying, "Okay, so are you looking to redefine your core values?" We we talked about that a few a couple of years ago. I said, "No, this is an opportunity for us to expedite those core values. Um, it's not normal, and if we're going to retool these things, is there a way that we can inject policies, lenses, processes to get that change faster?" Uh, you all know we have a, a climate action goal that's in 10 years. That should happen about tomorrow. Um, these things are coming fast. And so let's, let's prepare ourselves um, as we can. I also appreciated during the conversations, people actually recommended things. It wasn't, hey, this is terrible, and hang up. We talked about having a lens. We hear this a lot. Uh, we need an equity lens. We need a resiliency lens. How can we about looking at our budgets? way we spend money on policies and making sure that everything is resilient. Another side note, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but under the black imagination, when I'm saying resilient, that's not necessarily 
earthquakes and flood. This is resiliency in, in what we have right now. So if we're going to be re-examining that, let's look at that as big as we possibly can. And I guess that third bullet under proposed actions, critically examine growth, prosperity, limits, and what we actually needed more. I, would, I want to stop there. Again, we have three more if we want to have any questions, but that was that came out loud and clear by several individuals. Anyway. Okay. We'll go on to the second one. Lack of, but need for imagination. Kind of segueing to what I had just said, um, we were unprepared for this. In many ways, pandemics don't come around, so it's somewhat understandable that we weren't prepared for it, but we really should have been. A uh, direct quote was, this is a dry run to climate change. Uh, this is, these are not, we're not even through phase one yet, or the first wave, I should say. What's going to happen when a second or a third or these things? I also want to comment on the second bullet. It really struck me when it said, wake up, uh, that we're unprepared for big disasters and we're floundering with people even without loss of infrastructure. We just can't be around each other. That really struck a chord. This isn't an earthquake. Hmm. Every bridge is there. There are no cracks in our roads. Buildings are still here. Everything's fine. Except everything is so not fine. And if we're in this much chaos when everything has not been disrupted, except we just can't be in physical contact with each other, what's going to happen when those really do hit? And that really struck me as, again, expanding the concept of resiliency and emergency and being prepared is that imagination. Um, I do not often quote Donald Rumsfeld, but having that imagination of what can possibly happen. So that was, I came out and again, preparing for climate crisis and that we need plans. We need to start looking at this. So one of the more innovative uh, two people actually said the same thing, different phrases a crisis playbook or a resiliency kit. You know, break glass when it hits. Uh, can we get unemployed checks? Can we get local business assistance? Um, can we open up streets? What just immediately, this triggers no votes. But since we've gone through this before, let's try that again. Let's make sure that we have these things so we're ready to go uh, if another crisis happens. That was not small. Uh, I can, I, I'm having a hard time remembering any interview that at some point didn't mention in some way, shape, or form this, we have to think bigger. Climate change is going to be expanding this. These kind of issues, they're only going to continue. So, again, I want to stop there. These are big ticket items. Commissioner Ojo? I think that uh, one of the things that's most striking to me when I hear of those comments in particular is that um, this issue of scale. And we can only do and affect so much here at the county scale. Um, we can do a little bit more uh, through our collective uh, impact at the state level, but what we really need is federal level leadership for some of these things. Wait two seconds. <laughs> Perfect segue into the next section, which is the level of government. Um, absolutely, I could not agree more with you. Were there other questions from anyone? Well, I, I just had a, a comment. Uh, We've been, uh, any level of government has uh, been uh, kind of beaten up for at least the last 40 years. We had a president in the early 1980s that said the nine most terrifying words in the English language is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And uh, so it, it uh, and I recently saw a factoid of health departments across the country have lost 50,000 employees in the last decade or two. So, oh, okay. And, and so uh, we, we were unprepared and uh, some of that was deliberate. And uh, this is an opportunity to Kind of redefine what uh, government's function is, and uh, maybe uh, scale up where we where we uh, hollowed out uh, um, different uh, skill sets. Well, let's just hop into the next section because you both are hitting for me, and I need to be I need to contain myself as you will know, I'm a student of government and and. I do appreciate government, I, I really do. 
this was fascinating to me that very similar to imagination, I'm having trouble not have, uh, recalling a, a conversation that didn't at some point reference, this is really shaking up what the roles of government are. One person, especially when it comes to unemployment, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on unemployment here, but I mean this in safety nets in general. Um, when we lost half of our uh, restaurant staff and, all the, and, and leisure staff, that hit and it overwhelmed our state. A conversation I had with, with a business owner in the community was they had seen this shift from local government safety nets to the state. Now, on, on efficiency levels, that makes sense. Except we've been un underfunding that resource at the state because we've had so-called a booming economy and everyone's fine. But when that rug was pulled out, where were these safety nets? Three interviewees, adults, all said they had still not received their unemployment checks. That's four months. Where's where is that safety net? Where are where is that? And it was surprising there. This wasn't the twenty year old unemployment. These were the adults who whose wife has still not received it. So where is that? Where do we as a local government have an obligation to at least explore that? That was a direct quote as well. Again, as you said, Commissioner Malone, we can't do everything for everyone. We just don't have the finances and we're gonna be hit with budgets just like everyone else. There is though, I, I heard and I also believe we should be having this conversation of where is an opportunity for us to have those safety nets and the support here at a local level because this is not, it's not like the state's gonna open up in the next couple months. Um, federal agencies are already talking about this. So uh, or decreasing the 600 to 200, and this is all happening right now. So what is the role, especially with federal agencies helping with PPPs and then employment, but completely not there on the COVID, and I think that's a fair statement, a political statement uh, response. Comment after comment, especially from the business community, just so much confusion on who's saying what, where is this information coming from? So I share that with you. Again, it was very rare that it did not come up. And one very specific conversation was that second bullet in which we say, uh, need to ensure living wage opportunities. We want tourism, which usually uses non-living wage employees, which is a difficult tension. But we had mentioned earlier that these are some of the tensions that were brought up that we would appreciate uh, maybe a little deeper dive at a goal setting or something. But um, their point was, it's great we have the lodging tax uh really appreciate edo getting away from trade sector that came up a lot like move shifting away from trade sector only into more food and beverage and getting that localism here come here mountain bike have some beverages those kinds of things but that's predicated on a on a workforce that are the first to go this was not an answer exercise you asked me on a listening tour on a mr fix it tour so not too many answers, uh, but that came up loud and clear. Uh, yeah, and, and also one of the, another tension was coming from the business community, and this is right on the front page of most newspapers, the business community is saying $600 allows labor to kind of quote, sit on their can. On the other hand, talking to my, the two unemployed, this is the first time they've ever had a savings account. Um, one was on food stamps maxed out cars i mean I, again this is not the place to fix it but it's an opportunity that we heard that there are those tensions in this community that we should at least address so uh i want to stop there so we have enough time to get to the next two sections questions or comments from commissioners oh, okay very fine. okay uh then we get into the perception i want to share this with you uh Voices in my head are comments of you keep talking to the same people, you'll hear the same voices. And I love Henry Ford's. If they asked me what they wanted, people would have said faster horses. Uh, what we hear, who's the we is basically what this is. There was a multiple comments of saying, oh, people think this is what Corvallis is. We think this is what that, it really is. And there's some point blank. We think that we're a um, middle class, but we're not. This shows it feels like everything's fine, but this shows it really isn't. It just kind of showcases the who is the we and who are we talking about when we say how are we perceiving our community? Because not, as we all know, not every boat is rising and falling at the same rate. Uh, I, it was very interesting, and this is, I want to be 
full disclosure, this was the way I interpreted the conversation. I heard and I felt from the interviews that people who weren't as impacted didn't see COVID as negative as those who were directly impacted. And I think that's fair. I think that's human nature. Yeah, yeah. If you're not experiencing the negatives, then you're not perceiving it. You may not feel it. But that came out, again, in the interviews, I, I felt that. So I wanted to uh, highlight that. Um, and the second bullet really came out. I know it because I know it. I mean, if you're in it and you know these services exist and you know that um, I can call someone, hi, Mark, EDO, Kate, Jerry were specifically identified. Great job. This is really great. Lori Sarha, Brian, uh, Matt Gillespie on food. I mean, we had very specific comments. Great job on your outreach. On the other side, like with the EEOC, not everybody knew that, were, that was happening. Um, I shared with Aaliyah and Alyssa that we heard from the coalition, the sustainability coalition, and people like, why are you shutting the EOC down? We're still in this COVID. There, if you're not in there. And a very specific point was from one of the unemployed saying, you know, Sean, is it, would it be impossible for the for Benton County to have a mental health hotline? I mean, because this is a lot of stress. Well, we all know we have one. So how do one person specifically said, you cannot outreach enough, you cannot communicate ever enough, and how can we get new ways to make sure that our community knows the resources that are available, especially in these tough times. So, want to stop there with the perception? Okay. The last two were just real quick. Um, it was compelling to get, um, to have so many people recognize the larger COVID issue and the Black Lives Matter and the social unrest issue. Several people made connections. Equity, just like in the 2040 exercise categories formed, uh, one of the 20-ish categories was equity. It is by far the biggest chunk, especially on, on uh, question six, which is that open mind. Um, so I just thought it was, I wanted to share that with you. Several interviewees made that connection. And then the last one I just wanted to share, uh, almost half of everyone said, thank you so much for doing this. Just to you commissioners for allowing me to go out and, and take a pulse of what's going on, not just in the business community, but also in our community who is tied to our economy. Uh, with five minutes to go, the back page is just a quick synopsis of some of the comments that we heard on positive and negatives, which you can look at or we can revisit uh, more in depth, either a goal setting or, or, a, or a meeting down the path. So with that, uh, I, I am. That was the presentation I wanted to give. I didn't know if questions or or Lee, if you had anything to add. I have a question, um, Sean. Sure, I haven't yeah. had a chance to look at that in depth at the, the uh, materials you you uh, provided. I guess I'm a little bit uh, a little bit more uh, interested in what what I know the, what the time frame was for for doing these community conversations. Uh, reaction just with the current uh, environment how are people handling it uh, and so th th those things don't necessarily come out in in in, in uh, some of the responses but there's certainly the nonverbal communications that go along with that and so I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about that if I heard you correctly it was a little bit it was uh, the perception of how people are handling the crisis is that did uh -huh. I hear that correctly now that's correct okay I think there was, uh, it depends upon the topic, confusion, messaging especially. Um, we're being bombarded, even people who are part of this. Are masks required? Are masks not required? Do masks help? Um, a lot of comments about why didn't the commissioners require masks and the police come into every store and kick people out if they weren't wearing their masks. I think that's fair. It's untenable, but it's fair. it's a fair conversation that you're just being bombarded with so much information. We are, again, I'm not being political. I think that's a fair assessment that we're not getting federal leadership on what we're supposed to be doing. That's coming from the state. But that's, it's not always congruous with local governments. And so I think that one thing was just that uneasiness of just not understand, like just getting bombarded. The unemployment, several, just how do I make a living? And that was not just the unemployed. Again, a couple of people who have spouses or others. Uh, again, also asking who you, 
who you are uh, in talking with some of the equity people. Uh, if you're not properly documented, you can't get any of the unemployed uh, benefits. What I was I did not know is if you're married and you join file you file jointly, your spouse can't get it either. And so that was these are some of the little things that kind of came out about this is very stressful. This is not if, if, if everything is so blooming and thriving, what happened? And that is also with the businesses. The businesses that are going to be okay had a little bit more positive or a little bit easier perception. Those were hanging on by a thread did not. So I think that there's just a lot of confusion um, and we're trying to get through this. I want to end on a positive note. I also heard a ton of, hey, we're in this together. And Oregon is a community. Bend County is a community. We we came together. The Mass Brigade, the uh, when the vandalism happened, downtown Corvallis, 21,000 in two days, two, three days, something like that. We are a community. And that also came out loud and clear that we can galvanize and we're going to get through this. It's just maybe not the peaches and cream. Just a follow Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, just a follow up in terms of uh, when we do get out of this situation, I guess I'd be curious to know as, as bit revisiting some, some of the people that, that you've talked to and saying, how's it going now? You know, because I think there might be different responses uh, at that point in time. Right now, uh, it, there's a lot of stress. And, and so I'm not sure uh, if, if people are really speaking for the long term or not. So that, that's a question I have. Commissioner, uh, great. Um, it was remarkable and wonderful in the 2040 public engagement to have two phases. One were the listening sessions and then have the council come up with what they felt were the core values. Then we went out on phase two and certain uh, imperative communities read those words differently than, than were intended. And that, that gut check that, did we get this right? No, not quite, let's fix this, was I think, uh, give a lot of credence and credibility to, to the core values. Similarly, I really appreciate your comment. It's, this is how you're feeling when you're in it. How do you feel when we're out of it? And are we ever going to be really out of it? Or is it going to be a new normal? And how do we reconcile all of that? So <clears throat> at, I, and it's going to be a yeah. wonderful exercise. Yeah. Well, uh, a word I have underlined on uh, my notes is opportunity. When, when things are going pretty good, uh, there's enough momentum and enough people are satisfied with uh, how things are going to make it uh, pretty tough to change course. But uh, this really is a opportunity on all levels of government, on, on all levels of uh, society's efforts to uh, take a look and, and uh, how can we do things differently, how can we be more fair, uh, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, where we can really put some effort, whether it's on the federal level and changing the uh, tax code to stop uh, shoveling money to the people at the top. Uh, because it's obvious that uh, uh, people at the lower e incomes uh, were barely getting by before, and, and now uh, it's a crisis. So, uh, and I guess my other comment uh, that was an e for for interviewing about 20 people. That was a pretty impressive uh, list and, and a diverse uh, group and uh, it, it's interesting with with that kind of diversity to get uh, comments that uh, kind of lined up, that there was a lot of uh, agreement in, uh, uh, in the comments, which it makes, I don't know if that makes your job uh, uh, harder or easier, but uh, uh, well, if I can real quick, um, thank you. I, it was wonderful to meet with so many different people, uh, but I do want to end with your comment about opportunity. My favorite quote was, don't want to waste a good crisis just to go back to it. Yep. So mm -hmm. that came out more than once. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. So one last question. Um, 
we're going to talk about this a little bit more at goal setting. And at that point, are we going to talk about um, some of the strands of what realistically we can pick up and chew on now and, and change? Is that the direction? Because that's where my mind is going, and I, I want to just make sure about when and where is the appropriate time to have that conversation. Right. I want to defer to Lily on that one. Thanks, Sean. I realized I had my microphone pointed to the back of my head, so I just had to swing that around towards my mouth. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yes, Commissioner, that's what we anticipate. So in some of this more ambiguous work, qualitative work, it's sort of hard to know, okay, what is the exact next step? And so what we were hoping for um, in our next discussion is to bring the next set of questions to you and potentially bring some options for next steps, for recommended next steps on what to do. Um, and I think that to kind of bring it together in terms of your chewing on, I think that what we want to bring is options for how to chew on it. Um, and then the board certainly can uh, direct us next uh, steps from there. So um, if it's all right with you, I think maybe another um, hour at goal setting, if that sounds okay, in terms of to finish up the presentation and then to have further discussion. Okay. That sounds good. That, that would be great because that, that goal setting isn't uh, that far away and so some uh, continuity of the conversation. Uh, one comment that got my attention uh, that uh, government's not nimble and uh, <laughs> I uh, I forget, uh, I think it was new employees orientation and I, I came up with uh, Benton County is a bureaucracy. We have over 500 employees, but we, we don't have to be bureaucratic and uh, trying to figure out how to be more uh, efficient and uh, deliver the uh, services as quickly and uh, well as we can should uh, is a goal and uh, take this opportunity to see uh, see how we're organized and, and if we can do things any better but uh, I, I uh, really appreciate the efforts and I know how hard it is to summarize uh, a, a wide-ranging group of people's comments into uh, an efficient summary. So uh, uh, I think you did a great uh, uh, job, John, and uh, I think uh, probably, I forget if it's two or three weeks, and we'll uh, continue this. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. for the opportunity. Yep, thank you all. All right. Uh, we are to, uh, and, and Zan, I just saw your request, and uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I, uh, I, I lose track of where I'm supposed to be looking, but uh, I think we can probably finish this up in uh, five or 10 minutes, depending on Commissioner uh, reports. Uh, do you have anything for us, Annabelle? Uh, I don't. We uh, transportation committee me uh, meeting is uh, the cog has not been meeting so much, and so I, I think it mostly it's just individual con uh, telephone calls, things like that. So uh, outside outside uh, responsibilities are are kind of in a suspense okay. uh, mode. Uh, Zan. Um, I think the only other thing to report is that the, we're continuing to um, see opportunities come up in the arena of being able to address the digital divide of people that have um, access to uh, broadband and devices and the ability to do things online and those that don't. So um, I, the, uh, there may be a private donor that is willing to help with uh, K-12 access and uh, thanks to um, nimble action by uh, Mary and Joe. We are helping to support that along with the Education Service District. Uh, the Education Service District will pick up from here and they're helping to inform the proposal to go out to uh, address needs. So um, uh, aside from that, 
uh, I've been working primarily with the um, Hope Group and um, continuing to work um, on how we move forward with our criminal justice systems improvement work. Okay. Uh, would it be appropriate to uh, put the broadband discussion at goal setting, or uh, do you think there would be enough uh, information to uh, do an update? I don't think that there's that much new information right now. It's very much in a, a, a stage of having um, uh, the four-county proposal out uh, to the Economic Development Administration, and then with the other um, private dollars, uh, I don't expect that we'll know anything for a couple of weeks at least. If there's an update, then certainly, but uh, that's not certain. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of interest in this area right now, uh, but everything requires fast reaction time. So again, I'm very grateful to uh, our staff for being able to react swiftly. Well, uh, there is a lot of interest in, and uh, from what I've uh, seen, there's some uh, funding possibilities. So it's a matter of getting organized and figuring out uh, who to uh, contact for um, uh, some financial help. But uh, th th that is a critical effort. Uh, I mean, it, it's was always important and with uh, so much uh, re remote education that it, it's it's essential. So uh, I don't think I have uh, anything to re <coughs> report. Um, did you have something, Joe? Uh, commissioners, just uh be aware that we are remaining extremely vigilant with the issue as it relates to uh, two employees testing positive for uh, coronavirus. Uh, I had a team of folks working last Friday and over the weekend. Uh, we did, I think, an outstanding job of bringing a contractor in to sanitize the Avery facility uh, that was done on Saturday. Uh, we are monitoring the situation closely. We have a host of employees that are self-quarantining that uh, had potential exposure. Uh, so know that Charlie and his group did an excellent job, uh, as well as uh, a number of members of our leadership team that helped uh, uh, and spent lots of hours over the weekend in preparation for this week. Well, I, I think that raises a good point, is uh, a lot of our frontline folks have um, been um, putting in probably too much time in the last four months or so, and uh, it was encouraging that the health department has figured out, uh, you know, after trying different plans on uh, how not to, how to be organized and not wear people out, that uh, getting some actual new people in to uh, expand the, the team. Uh, and I, I think that's a, that's a good model. And I guess the other uh, part of that is uh, repurposing employees to to fit the uh, current situation better than than our uh, traditional structure. Agree, uh, Commissioner Hermio. Additional uh, yeah, questions? Yeah, my question has to do. You know, the, the Avery uh, situation kind of brought another question to me in terms of. How are other administrative staff are doing? We've got several different groups in this particular building, uh, and how 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 they're how they're alternating or structuring their time because I don't want to wear them out either. They they they've got uh, a lot on their plate, so that I, that was my curiosity. Uh, Commissioner, it just depends on what department you're referencing. Every well, I'm, I'm 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 thinking about well, you know that there's uh, finance, there's uh, Human resources. There's the assessor's office over mm -hmm. here, and, uh, and they all have specific functions. But just want to make, I want to be sure that they're they're taking care of themselves as well, and uh, because their work is very important in all this work. Agreed. Right now. Uh, unfortunately, I will tell you in some of those departments you just mentioned, we have uh, very little depth, and so right. uh, we are maximizing the use of our employees and uh, all of our employees, including. Uh, management staff are working 
far in excess of their normal schedules. Uh, however, we are uh, employing teleworking, we are employing alternative schedules, so each department has the flexibility to uh, use the tools that we're providing in the toolbox that works best for them. And so I would uh, tell you that we are uh, continuing to encourage uh, teleworking where we can. Uh, for example, in uh, human resources, they're certainly taking advantage of that while they're uh, ensuring that the st office is staffed. Uh, the majority of staff on any given day are teleworking and then they're rotating through the office. Um, most other departments are using some uh, variation or flavor of that and we do have a, a number of departments that are uh, really focusing on alternative schedules uh, to ensure that employees uh, can be spread out or not be exposed to one another and so I think that seems to be working as well. That's good to hear and then I see that the staff from the various groups that, that reside in this building are, are all uh, staffing the front desk so they're all taking turns and I really want to say thank you to to um, all those groups because they're, they're, there's a variety of folks out there but they're they're hanging in there and that's good they are everybody's uh, pitching in and doing their part yeah I, I guess uh, a short report we, we had a meeting with uh, um, Corvallis uh, government folks uh, on a class last Thursday and spent um, most of the meeting on uh, discussing their um, YS initiative um, program and, and getting a little more background on, on that and, and hope to uh, kind of uh, get a little better idea what 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 they have in mind for for that program but uh, uh, if there's nothing else, we will adjourn this meeting and if uh, nothing comes up in the interim, our uh, next board meeting is next Tuesday, uh, August 4th at 9 o'clock. So, Commissioner, I would uh, just uh, make sure everybody is aware. I believe that we have a, uh, let's see, is that tomorrow? Actually, that is not. It's actually next uh, Wednesday, I believe. Uh, as well, uh, where the board will be meeting. If my computer will co cooperate, I'll refresh everybody's memory. Uh, actually, it's a different date that I'm thinking of, so strike that comment. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say I don't have anything the uh, rest of the week. So, August 4th, and uh, thank you all for your participation today. and. Stay healthy, stay cool, and uh, see you next Tuesday.